Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. The jury now has the case. Welcome to the fastest show in politics with deliberations now underway in Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial in New York. We have arrived as we wait for a verdict. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines, who's back with us today in Washington on the fastest show in politics. It's great to see you. Welcome back. Conventional wisdom has been that this will be a quick deliberation. And we've had some very smart legal minds explain why they Mm -hmm. think that, Kaylee. But we're trying not to project or anticipate whatever's going to happen. The way this takes place will happen live, it'll be unfiltered, and we'll bring it to you as soon as we learn it here on Bloomberg. Yeah, in the meantime, though, it is just a waiting game. None of us know what is happening inside that room. Pretty remarkable. Uh, We did hear from him earlier in court. No lawmakers that I'm aware of, no Hollywood actors for that matter. We had Robert De Niro in front of the courthouse yesterday, which was a strange turn. Uh, The Biden campaign working that out with him. But we did hear from Donald Trump uh, earlier Talking about the rigged trial, here's what he said in the lobby of the courthouse. I would say, in listening to the charges from the judge, who's, as you know, very conflicted and corrupt because of the confliction, very, very corrupt. Uh, Mother Teresa could not beat these charges. These charges are rigged. The whole thing is rigged. Mother Teresa could not beat these charges. Let's get into it with Elizabeth Widra. Glad to say she's back with us. Constitutional Accountability Center president and Supreme Court litigator. Elizabeth, it's great to have you. When you hear Donald Trump talk like that, Mother Teresa couldn't beat the rap. Was he convinced by the job the prosecution did in this trial? Yes. Well, I think, you know, um, when people hear Trump claim the trial is rigged and so forth, You know, what I think is really important to remember is that the people who are deliberating right now, they are the ones who are going to decide, not the judge, whether or not former President Trump will be convicted of these felony counts or not. This is a jury of everyday Americans, everyday New Yorkers who are going to listen very carefully to all the testimony, all the evidence, look at all the documents, think about the jury instructions that were given to them. Um, and mm-hmm. and these everyday Americans are the ones who are going to be deciding Trump's fate. So when he says that it's rigged, it's really an attack on those Americans, which I think that, you know, whether you support uh, Donald Trump or not, most people have faith in our jury system. The founders of our country believed very deeply in the jury as a fundamental part of democracy. It's something we don't maybe think about that much anymore. You know, people maybe will try to get out of jury service or whatever. But to the founders of the United States, it was an incredibly important bulwark of liberty. Those were words that they used to ensure that we had a country that was ruled by law, that no one was above the law, including, Mm -hmm. in this case, a former president, and that no matter how powerful or how vulnerable you were, your fate would always be left in the hands of your peers. And here, that's what is going on right now as this jury deliberates. Well, Elizabeth, also the entire notion that a defendant is innocent until proven guilty and that there has to be guilt beyond a reasonable doubt for the jury to actually convict uh, any defendant Donald Trump or otherwise, of a crime. That was detailed in the 55 pages of jury instructions that Judge Mershon read out today. What did you make of the actual instructions themselves? It took almost an hour and a half for him to get through them, speaking to the idea that there are some complicated elements to the things that they are considering in that room. For sure. And jury instructions in any case are always going to be incredibly important. And there are there's a lot of what the jury was instructed on today that is um, par for the course in any criminal case. So the judge is going to be talking to them about exactly what you just said, what reasonable doubt means, you know, how much certainty. Obviously, we really don't know anything um, in life with a complete 100% sense of certainty. Um, so what is beyond a reasonable doubt? The judge also will give a very standard um, uh, instruction about, you know, certain types of evidence, um, what certain as- 
aspects of the laws at issue of this case mean. And then there were the instructions that were more specific to this case about the credibility and corroborating evidence of witnesses and then documentary corroborative evidence that was heard in the court. So it, it's important that these instructions were very detailed and they were. And you know, one thing that's unique about New York is that um, apparently the jurors do not get to take those instructions back with them to the jury room. So I think that might mean that we might get some more questions than usual from the jury as they're going about weighing this evidence against the law and following the instructions that they're given. I wanna ask you something, I wanna be careful with this. Uh... Elizabeth, as we talk about the jury, there is reporting today in a couple of places, the bulwark first to report a skeptical juror who may be Trump friendly, has appeared to nod along in accordance with the defense, lit up when J.D. Vance walked in the room, smiled when Michael Cohen was in the throes of cross-examination. The New York Times has gone so far as to identify the number of that juror today. Is this dangerous? And what does it mean potentially for a deadlock jury? Well, I think that, you know, we certainly need to be careful about um, not attacking the jury. And, you know, Judge Marchand has been very adamant throughout this process and in the um, uh, contempt order that uh, was issued against Donald Trump for violating the gag order about attacking witnesses and the jury. So it's incredibly important that that jurors be allowed to do their job um, without fear of intimidation. You know, certainly, look, the jury was selected by both the prosecution and defense. So one would assume that the defense got some jurors in the panel that they thought would be favorable to them. Um, that's, mm -hmm. you know, part of this adversarial process that we have when we have a jury trial. So, you know, the defense tries to pick jurors that they think will um, vote in favor of uh, their client and the prosecution looks for jurors who will weigh the evidence fairly, which they think will lead to a conviction. And so, you know, I think that if you, you know, the reporting about some of the jurors, there was someone who followed Trump on uh, Truth Social, you know, Probably a lot of people don't have truth social unless they are um, in some ways favorable to Donald Trump, but I suppose they're always outliers. But I think one thing that's important to remember is that the jury is a um, collaborative, deliberative body. And that's one of the things that makes it so unique. You need to have unanimity. And so part of that is the jurors coming together, reasoning things out together, working together to try to come to results. There are instances of hung juries. That's where one juror is, yeah. um, or perhaps more than one is a holdout. But often mm -hmm. we do see unanimous verdicts because there is that kind of pressure to come to a group decision. If though there is still that one holdout, Elizabeth, if we can just game this forward, knowing we have no idea what the outcome here is going to be, and there is a hung jury and therefore a mistrial, what recourse does the prosecution have? Does everything just end there? Could they get another uh, attempt, another swing at this before the presidential election, knowing how hard it was to get this case to go to trial the first time around, let alone the many others that don't look like they will within the next six months? Yeah, basically, I think that this would be the end of the road then if there is a hung jury. You know, it's um, it's a an issue that I think the judge will be trying to get jurors to come to a unanimous decision, whether that's um, acquittal or conviction. You know, you always want a jury to come to a decision. And that's that's really what the process is is aimed at doing, whether it's through the jury to, in, on their own or through the judge working with the jury to see if they can come to an agreement. And again, that that's not pressure to come to a conviction. It's a pressure to come to a unanimous agreement because you want the jury to really render a verdict, um, whether it's a verdict of acquittal or a conviction. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, we're in the wait uh, here at this point, Elizabeth, and we're trying not to speculate. I just wonder though, the longer this takes, who you see it helping, does a lengthy deliberation actually help the prosecution in this case? You know, I think this is, um, so the, the common wisdom has always been that, you know, a quick verdict is usually a guilty verdict. Yeah. And the longer it goes on, the more likely it's going to be either a hung jury or an acquittal. Um, you know, that has certainly, especially in high profile cases, that, that conventional wisdom has gone out the window. Um, the OJ Simpson verdict, for example, was quick and obviously an acquittal. Um, 
you know, here I think that again, that conventional wisdom might not necessarily hold because look, the case itself, no matter who the defendant is, is one that has a lot of moving parts. So the jury is going to want to take their time and be very deliberative about it. But also these are human beings who know that they are dealing with a historic, truly momentous and unprecedented situation here with the former president of the United States um, facing criminal conviction. And that is a serious matter. So I think they're going to take their jobs very seriously. So I think that if they take their time to make sure they get it right, that in this case perhaps is not as indicative of whether it's going to be an acquittal or a conviction as it might be in the run of the mill case. But I do think, you know, if we're looking at going into next week, um, you know, then we're going to be looking very closely at what questions are coming out of the jury room to try to get a Mm -hmm. sense of where the jury is. Those questions, I think, will be very interesting to watch and will be read as tea leaves of what the jury is thinking. Surely. Well, we're less than two hours in so far. We'll see how long this ultimately takes. Elizabeth Wydra, Constitutional Accountability Center president and Supreme Court litigator. Thank you so much. We have no time frame, Joe, as to how long it will be before we actually get a verdict from this jury. What we do know, though, is that verdict is going to be coming well before not just the presidential election, but the Republican convention, which, of course, is in July. All of this is running into very interesting. It's incredible to, to think that we're in the throes of a campaign here. Mm-hmm. And as Donald Trump uh, waits word on his fate, Joe Biden leaving the bubble today to yep. go to Pennsylvania, talking about some hard issues that have been dogging him on the campaign trail, including Israel. Yeah, absolutely. And perhaps the spotlight is even more sharply on the question of Israel after the events of the last several days That's with 45 right. people killed in Rafa, though the White House maintains that Israel has not, in fact, crossed its so called red line, at least Mm -hmm. at this point. What we're hearing from Israel, though, today is that they think this fighting is going to last for a significantly longer period of time, seven months to be exact, getting us to the end of the year. Ian Marlowe is with us now. He is a senior reporter covering uh, diplomacy uh, for us here at Bloomberg. So, Ian, we obviously are hearing uh, signs from Israel that they do think that defeating Hamas ultimately is going to take a significantly longer period of time. At the same time, it feels that the patience of the Biden administration when it comes to their effort in Rafah is going increasingly thin. So how much longer can Israel continue with the continued support of the U.S. in terms of still getting everything that the U.S. is currently providing? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, uh, especially this week, everyone is asking that question. And uh, I think we got a little bit of a preliminary answer from the Biden administration, which is there's still more leeway here. They still think to some degree that the only thing riskier than continuing on the current Israel policy is changing the Israel policy. So, I mean, you saw a little bit uh, of a flavor of that when they paused that heavy bombs shipment Mm -hmm. um, a couple of weeks back now. Uh, it, It infuriated Republicans. It annoyed people on the left because they wanted uh, more. They wanted like mm-hmm. a bigger halt to all weapons that were going. Yeah. And it, it blew up in their face in Israel where Netanyahu uh, almost looked like uh, stronger at the end of the day because mm-hmm. he was able to kind of be a little bit more defiant and sort of vow to press into Rafa even more. So to some degree, there's a host of bad options here right now for the US and I think um, it's it's clear that that Israel has not done enough to to sort of go over that red line. The the difficulty for the U.S. now, uh, you know, with Hamas reconstituting in North Gaza, I think people thought maybe Rafa would be the end of the war, right? Yeah. That this would be once they pushed into Rafa, that would be it. They would get Hamas leadership and it would be over. But that's you know not the case. It looks like this is going to go on for you know, potentially into the next term of whoever wins in in November. And so I think uh, the longer this drags on, the more difficult it is for the administration, for sure. Well, of course, the administration is spinning a couple of plates right now. The other would be Ukraine or one other would be Ukraine. Interesting to see the deputy treasury secretary in Kyiv this morning, Wally Adiyama, on his first visit to Kyiv, spoke with us a short time ago about sanctions on Russia. Let's listen to what he had to say and we'll have you respond. Here's the secretary. In the United States and our allies and partners are going to be open to sanctioning any company or individuals that provide material support to Russia's military industrialized complex because we want to make sure that Russia doesn't have access to the goods they need to fight the war they want here in Ukraine. 
We're going to have our full conversation for our uh, viewers and listeners a little bit later on this hour with the Deputy Treasury Secretary. Does his visit suggest that sanctions have been a failure so far? Is it time for secondary sanctions? That's a good question. I mean, I think the issue here really, I mean, what he's talking about is is China, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, Chinese companies, the Chinese government has has been willing to provide that sort of support to, to Russia in a way that I think caught a lot of U.S. officials off guard. I think American officials in the early days of the war, especially after Ukraine mounted a, a kind of valiant defense of Kyiv, yeah. that, that this was, you know, that Russia, the sanctions were going to cripple Russia's military industrial complex and that would be it. Mm -hmm. But over time, we've seen with Chinese support this is you know, Russia's been able to reconstitute their base, and they've made a lot of gains. And I think that's really worrying for for U.S. officials. And I think there's been a lot of warnings. We got those warnings from Janet Yellen uh, when she visited China. Uh, Blinken, uh, when he went, I was on that trip, yeah. uh, kind of echoed that message. And this is another sort of reassertion uh, of that. I think probably uh, serving to remind China here that if they don't. Uh, clamp down a little bit on some of those companies, the U.S. is going to do it for them. Really great to have you back, Ian. When he's not traveling with the <laughs> Secretary of State, we try to get him here at the table in Washington. Bloomberg senior reporter covering diplomacy, Ian Marlowe. Great to have you. And Kaylee, these are some of the stories we're going to be following over the course of the rest of this hour. We'll hear this conversation I had earlier with Wally Adiamo a bit later on. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. With news today, the Deputy Treasury Secretary, Wally Adiamo, has touched down in Kyiv. His first trip to Ukraine now as part of the administration's efforts to shore up Ukraine's economy and, of course, support Ukraine in its war with Russia. He is the administration's point person, the Treasury's point person on sanctions, which is partly what brought him to Kyiv this week. And I had an opportunity to spend some time talking with him first, knowing that air raid sirens were blaring in Kyiv just moments before he joined us on Bloomberg TV and radio. I started by asking him about the mood on the ground. Here he is. The moon in the capital today is one of urgency in terms of doing everything they can to defend their country. And I've been impressed by the brave men and women here in Ukraine and the fact that they are committed to fighting for their freedom and doing everything they can to build an economy and to build a free and democratic country. And I'm here because the United States wants to be their partner in doing exactly that. And in addition to talking to them about sanctions, I've been able to talk to them about our economic support and the ways in which we can make sure that the United States and our allies and partners stands with the brave men and women of Ukraine. You said just yesterday on your tour in Kyiv that an unacceptable amount of weapons components are still getting into Russia. There's sir, a sentiment that sanctions are simply not working. As the Treasury's point man on sanctions, does your trip confirm that? My trip confirms that we need to do more to make sure that our sanctions continue to stop Russia from being able to get the goods they need to build the weapons that they want. What we know is that the Kremlin has charged their intelligence services with trying to get around our sanctions, and we are concerned that Russia is getting access to key component parts, particularly from China and other countries that are allowing them to build these weapons. And what, what I'm here to do in Kyiv is to talk to my counterparts about the new tools we're considering to try and go after the ability of the Kremlin to do just that. Fundamentally, we can't do this alone in the United States. We need to do it with our allies and partners. And that's why I'm heading from here to Germany to give a speech and talk to my German counterparts about the importance of us acting together to stop those components yeah. from getting to Russia. Well, we're looking forward to that speech in Berlin. Will you announce secondary sanctions against those responsible for those components getting into Russian weapons? So I'm not going to preview, preview any actions that we're going to take, but what I will say is that I'm going to talk about the fact that the United States and our allies and partners are going to be open to sanctioning any company or individuals that provide material support to Russia's military industrialized complex because we want to make sure that Russia doesn't have access to the goods they need to fight the war they want here in Ukraine. Well, I know that there are a few components to this uh, that also include unlocking money from frozen Russian assets. 
I know Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is working on this right now with our G7 allies to use those proceeds for Ukraine. When can Kyiv plan to get that money? It's important to uh, um, give people context. When the war started, the United States and our allies and partners immobilized $285 billion of Russians assets that were held around the war a war chest that they had set up for this particular situation so they could use that to conduct the war that we were able to mm -hmm. mobilize. Now we're looking at ways to unlock those assets. Only five billion of them are in the United States, but collectively over 200 billion are in the G7, and our countries are working together to think about ways in which we can unlock the value of that for the benefit of the Ukrainian people. Secretary Yellen uh, at the G7 Finance Ministry has worked with her counterparts to set out a number of options that are now going to be given to leaders who are going to meet in June. And we look forward to those leaders when they meet in June, giving us political direction in terms of how we can unlock that value so that we can get that money to Ukraine so they can invest that money in rebuilding the infrastructure that Russia has destroyed and in defending their country. Well, talking about recovery here and rebuilding, you spent time earlier today at a round table at Kyiv's School of Economics. What was your message to the room? I think the most important thing for me was how that round table started. And it started with them giving me a tour of their bomb shelters. Because today, for almost any school that operates anywhere here in this country, they have to have a bomb shelter, which is unacceptable that young people have to live in a world where their education is conditioned on the idea of having access to those uh, shelters. But those young people were focused on helping, uh, helping to think through two things. One, how sanctions can be used to slow down Russia's ability to, ability to build the weapons that they want, but also on how they can build a successful economy here in Ukraine. And I had a chance to talk to them about the things the United States and their allies and partner are doing to support them in both of those efforts. And mm -hmm. it was impressive to see these young people who are focused on those issues and knowing that um, over time, those same young people are going to be contributing to the growth of the economy here in Ukraine and to the growth of their democracy as well. Well, we can't talk about sanctions, sir, without talking about oil. And it does seem that phase two of the oil price cap does not seem to be costing Moscow uh, the extent to which it was expected to. How can you, how can the Treasury Department get to this? So I think the key word you said there was cost. Oftentimes when we focus on the price cap, we focus on the revenue side and the cost of a barrel of, of euros. But the reality is that Russia's costs have went up significantly due to the price cap. Before the price cap, Russia was largely selling their oil to cheap places and using the G7 services to do so. Today, the cost of selling Russian oil has went up significantly because they've got to buy new tankers because we've went after some of the tankers that they're shipping the oil in. They've had to build up their own ecosystem to sell that oil, which has been more expensive for them. And our goal is to make sure that in addition to reducing their revenues, we significantly increase Russia's costs so that ultimately they have less income to give to the Kremlin to fight this war. But what the Kremlin is proving to us every day is that they are indifferent as to revenue. They are focused almost exclusively on building a wartime economy. And the best symbol of this is the fact that when President Putin replaced the defense minister, he replaced it with an economic official who's going to be focused on making sure that the Russian economy produces one thing and one thing only, which are the weapons that will help support this war. And our goal has to be to make sure that they don't have the goods they need to build those weapons. Mm -hmm. I have less than a minute, sir. You're talking about sanctions in Russia's economy in Kyiv. That's why we're together here. It was some time ago that U.S. sanctions were supposed to grind Russia's economy to a halt. We have not seen that happen, at least in the way that it was designed. Will the announcements, will the tools that you're rolling out this week in Ukraine and in Germany finish the job? So it's important for us to think about how we measure success when it comes to sanctions, which are a tool. And the way that we measure that is on Russia's ability to get access to the goods that they need to fight the war that they want. It is, and from our standpoint, the key thing that we have to do there is to go after the companies and the individuals who are providing them with those goods. That is the way that we are going to judge our success, is if Russia has fewer weapons to be able to fight their war in Ukraine, and we're able to provide the Ukrainians with the goods and the military equipment they need to defend themselves. That's the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, Wally Adiemo, with us live earlier from Kyiv.
You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. As we dig through primary results today, not a lot of people had their eyes on Texas last night, at least in the sense of the presidential primary cycle. But where there were some very important races, primary runoffs that a lot of folks are trying to connect the dots on here and tell a trend story, because that's what we do in journalism. It's not what Kyle Kondik does, though. He gives analysis on real results and he's with us right now from Sabado's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia. Kyle, it's great to see you. A lot of the headlines this morning were trying to gauge the extent to which Texas, that we're looking at here, has moved to the right, has moved to MAGA. Yet we see Congressman Tony Gonzalez fending off a challenge from his right. What's your takeaway? Uh, the race ended up being super close. He won by... A little over a point. Uh, and, you know, Gonzalez, I mean, I don't even necessarily know if you can you could describe many or any members of Congress as actual kind of centrist or moderates. Tony Gonzalez is yeah. a little bit closer to the center than, than many other House Republicans. Um, he backed some gun control measures after the, the horrible shooting in Uvalde a couple a couple years ago, which is in his district. Um, he also was was against sort of a, a more kind of right wing border control bill. Uh, Gonzalez was supported by House Republican leadership. Uh, he had a money advantage in this race against a guy named Brandon Herrera, who's sort of a, a YouTube star and is known for yeah. being kind of pro, yeah. very pro gun. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, I mean, look, I mean, in, in Republican primaries, you're, you're generally better off being the more right wing candidate even running against an incumbent. Incumbents very rarely lose House primaries. And here we have an instance of a, sure. of a House incumbent just hanging on by the skin of his teeth. Well, yeah, uh, there's a Brandon Herrera, uh, to your point, they call him the AK guy. And this had so much to do with Uvalde and the way Tony Gonzalez uh, voted following the shootings. But just 407 points separated them. To your point, Kyle, we can't really call this a big win for the establishment, can we? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. And, and look, I mean, um, you know, actually, we're, we're at about the halfway point in terms of the total number of congressional seats that have had primaries so far. In fact, um, actually, that district was, was it's about 220 or so out of the 435 districts. Only one incumbent has lost. And that was uh, in, in Alabama because of redistricting. Two Republican incumbents were basically put in the same district. So um, without redistricting, you probably wouldn't have any. Um, House incumbents who have lost primary so far, but there were some close calls. And this, of course, was an extremely close call. This race uh, to take on Henry Cuellar in the 28th district is one that has a lot of people's eyes on, certainly in part due to Mr. Cuellar's legal challenges at the moment. How important will this result be with Jay Furman winning the right to take on Henry Cuellar? Um, you know, the, the House Republicans really prioritized this race in 2022 um, and also, Cuellar had a, a, a you know, left-wing primary challenge. It's kind of a similar situation to what happened to, to Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. And Cuellar won two really tough primaries in both 2020 and uh, in 2022 against a more left-wing challenger. Um, and Cuellar ended up winning fairly easily in 2022, despite the fact that um, House Republicans uh, put in a lot of money and effort in that district. They basically gave Cuellar a pass here in 2024, and yet... Um, you have this pretty serious indictment of Cuellar, but um, I don't know if national Republicans are all that excited about their nominee in uh, in, in, in Texas 28 this time against Cuellar. So that one is sort of mm -hmm. it's on the periphery of the competitive map, um, but it doesn't hmm. seem like a, a super competitive race. But again, you've got a, a candidate running under a serious indictment. So, um, yeah, yeah I, exactly. I think it's worth watching. Absolutely. And we will be. I don't know to what extent you're focused uh, on the state house. Kyle, but the Republican Speaker of the State House in Texas survived a primary challenge by a Trump-backed candidate. To what extent does MAGA have a hold on the Republican Party in Texas or not? I mean, look, I think it's the the, the Speaker of the House in, in, in Texas has been maybe a, a little bit you know, or maybe not as far to the right as many other Texas Republicans are. And of course, that has led to some um, to, to some to some primary trouble. Um, the, the speaker survived. That uh, My understanding is that some of his allies, though, ended up losing. Uh, so maybe you see a leadership change there with you know, the next time the, the Texas State House meet, meets. And it is interesting that I think Texas is legitimately getting more competitive 
And yet the Republican Party there, if anything, is sort of moving more toward the right. I think we've seen this in like Arizona, for instance, which is which is a state that really has become a battleground recently. Uh, and mm -hmm. instead of sort of maybe moving a little bit more toward the middle, um, sometimes you see these parties kind of kind of double down on on being more kind of ideologically extreme. And I wonder if maybe that helps spur along, um, you know, Democratic growth in, in, in Texas. But again, Texas is definitely still a Republican leaning state, both in the context yes. of Ted Cruz's reelection bid uh, coming up here and also in the presidential race. Spending time with Kyle Kondek from Sabato's Crystal Ball at the University of Virginia. Kyle, I want to point you. To the top of the ticket, as we've been uh, talking about congressional races, even state level races in Texas, Joe Biden is leaving the bubble today to go back to Pennsylvania, which is seems to be a real drive by the campaign to shore up support among black voters who polling shows are turning away from Joe Biden, not necessarily toward Trump, although we have seen some evidence of that. This repeated visit, though, to Pennsylvania, along with states like Michigan. Is this going to be essentially a three-state campaign for Joe Biden? I mean, I mean, look, I mean, I think if you look at the polls, and I, I, I think the polls are probably overstating the extent of, of Trump's strength when we actually get down to the November election, although I, I only say that in the sense that I, I think if you looked at the polls now, you could argue Trump is a favorite. I basically just think it's kind of more of a 50-50 sort of proposition. But um, I do think that if Biden holds on to Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, he is pretty likely to win the presidential race. I think if he loses any of the three, he's pretty likely to lose. And so, yes, mm -hmm. you know, Georgia and Arizona and Nevada and North Carolina are also important. You know, those seven states together are the seven yep, yep. that were decided by three points or less in 2020. Um, but I mm -hmm. do think that, that, you know, it may be as simple as Biden holds on to those three industri northern industrial states or he doesn't hold on to, right. you know, one of them. And that could very well decide the election. So um, if, you know, it would makes sense to me that when we tally up the campaign visits at the end of the end of the campaign, um, you know, those three industrial states may lead for Biden. And that makes sense to me. It's a narrow path, Kyle. And we have to remind ourselves of this as we look at national polls. It's great to have you back. Don't be a stranger from the University of Virginia, Sabato's Crystal Ball, where he is managing editor Kyle Kondik with great analysis for us today on the fastest show in politics. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. There are now 12 people, American citizens, jury of his peers, sitting in a room to decide, Joe, whether or not he ultimately will be acquitted, convicted of these crimes, or perhaps end up in a mistrial. That's right. And six alternates have to mm -hmm. sit through this in the courtroom in case they are needed. Pretty remarkable. We did see Donald Trump a short time ago. Uh, he called it the trial rigged, as we've been hearing. He says Mother Teresa wouldn't be able to beat the charges outlined here. So he's clearly setting expectations, as is his campaign. And we have to talk about the political implications yes. here. And for that, we have our great political panel. Lisa Camuso Miller is with us, Republican strategist, former communications director at the RNC and host of the Friday Reporter podcast, alongside Jeannie Shanzano, Bloomberg Politics contributor, Democratic analyst. Great to have you both with us here. Uh, Lisa, I don't know your thoughts on what is about to transpire, but the campaign doesn't have the luxury. You have to start mapping out various uh, possibilities here, various scenarios. What's happening inside Trump HQ today? You know, Joe, uh, it, it strikes me that if you're the Trump campaign, you're going to proceed exactly the way you have been planning to proceed. You call this what they've been saying all along is that this is a uh, an overreach of government, that it is uh, just the kind of thing that, that that is going to happen to someone like Donald Trump. And you proceed strongly with that kind of um, that sort of positioning. If you're the Biden campaign, however, there are two very different scenarios, uh, two very different scenarios that could play out, actually three, really, if there's a hung jury. So there's a lot of opportunity for them to sort of think about how they're going to position themselves. Regardless, though, we should probably be expecting from the Biden campaign to hear that this should not be happening with someone who was a former president, regardless of the outcome. Well, Jeannie, it kind of raises the question for me as to whether or not acquittal or conviction for Donald Trump can be played as a win. If you're acquitted, obviously 
you are not a convicted felon. If you are a convicted felon, that has shown an incredible power to fire up and galvanize your base of supporters. Whereas for Joe Biden, if Donald Trump is convicted, it could galvanize Donald Trump's base of supporters, not bring more people into Joe Biden's camp necessarily. And if he's acquitted and that's the only trial that goes, you lose a lot of ammunition uh, when trying to counter him in a campaign. Is this win win for Donald Trump, lose lose for Biden? You know, I, I don't think so, unless the Biden team overplays its hand on this. Um, the reality is, is that this campaign is not going to be won or lost in a courtroom. It never was. It's got to be won or lost at the ballot box. And so I am suspect of what the Biden campaign did yesterday by bringing folks like Robert De Niro down there where the media are. I think you look at what's happening today. Donald Trump is saying to his folks that if I am convicted, I will appeal, it will endear me to voters. For example, African-American male voters who think the system is rigged. You juxtapose that to what Joe Biden is doing today with Kamala Harris, with Wes Moore and with others. He is going into Philly, two campaign stops there, to talk about what he has done for African-American voters. I'd much rather be the Biden campaign at this point than I would fighting for my life in the courtroom like Donald <laughs> Trump and saying, worst case scenario, scenario, I'm convicted. And boy, that's going to make me a sort of um, you know appealing figure to people who think our justice system is rigged. Mm -hmm. Yet, this criminal trial underway for six weeks has done nothing to damage Donald Trump's numbers, uh, certainly in polls, Lisa, he actually eclipsed Joe Biden when it comes to fundraising for the first time in this cycle just last month. Do we have any reason to believe a verdict would change that? No, I really don't think so. I mean, what I think we're looking at here is traditional campaigning, which is what you're seeing with the president taking his campaign to Philadelphia today. And you're seeing campaigning in 2024, where Donald Trump comes out from the courtroom and says a couple of things that are perhaps a little bit uh, inflation, just, well, insane for lack of a better way to put it, the fact that he talks about even how Mother Teresa couldn't escape this verdict. Uh, but regardless of all of that, it's the it's the traditional campaign and it's what's happening in 2024. And one is winning and one is not. Regardless of where you are on these two candidates, the, the, the difference is, is that Donald Trump is using this craziness and the insanity that is the courtroom to his advantage. And it's got him winning up against Joe Biden, who's running a traditional campaign. And Jeannie, it's worth pointing out while we're talking about this case in New York that was brought against him, he also has been charged with dozens of other crimes, three different other cases, two of them federal, one of them, of course, a state case down in Georgia. And the federal case, at least one of them here in Washington, brought by Jack Smith, is currently held up as we await a decision from the Supreme Court as to whether or not Donald Trump has presidential immunity. And ha there have been calls for one of the Supreme Court justices, Samuel Alito, to recuse himself from cases related uh, to January 6th in particular, after reports of uh, flags that were carried uh, by rioters at the Capitol on January 6th were flying outside two of his homes. We just heard in a letter to Congress from the justice Samuel Alito, that he is rejecting calls to step aside from those January 6th cases. He will not recuse himself from Trump or January 6th cases over the flag reports. Jeannie, what's your reaction to that? Perhaps not too unexpected. Not unexpected, but this is an example of something, and I'm so glad you raised this, that I think the Biden campaign should make a lot of hay about. These are things that impact all our lives. Those nine people have the final word on what the Constitution means. Not that long ago, Justice Alito voted to take away a right that women around this country have enjoyed for over 50 years, the right to choose. And he has done that. And then he has hung and blamed his or blamed his wife for hanging a flag upside down in the days after January 6th and said he will mm -hmm. not be moved to recuse himself. This is something the campaign should be talking about. Joe Biden should come out and take a stand and say, you know what, Congress, it is time to put in either a retirement age for Supreme Court justices, pack that court, do something because our rights are being limited by the folks on the court, hmm. three of which are Donald Trump appointees. 
I don't think that Joe Biden's going to do it, but uh, gosh, I hope he would, because this is the kind of thing hmm. that really matters to people much more than what happens in Manhattan to Donald Trump because of his hush money payment. Pack that court. <laughs> Jeannie just said, Lisa, what does that mean if that happens to the Biden campaign? You know, when Jeannie, some of Jeannie's points are so salient with me that they're still sort of sticking in my brain. I think the one thing mm. that I take away from all of this is that there is a constitutional crisis in this country. Not only does the Supreme Court have no oversight and they can they they are the law of the land, regardless of how they behave outside of the court, as we're seeing in real time. We're also looking at a case where there is a question about whether or not the president or former president is immune to all of these cases cases as they're coming through. And it, it's all of these things are a question of the Constitution. And so that really comes down to where is the accountability? And that to me is someone who's watching from the outside looking in, not necessarily from the campaign point of view, is how do you communicate that out to people who fundamentally are beginning to believe or already believe that the process, whether it's the electoral process or the Supreme Court process, is fundamentally broken in this country? And that, to me, is one that I think is going to take people to the, bol the polling places in November because I feel like they are really sort of fundamentally questioning whether or not our government is still working the way it's supposed to work. Hmm. Yeah, well, and Jeannie, just to give you the final word here as we consider what people are questioning about our government and the people currently sitting at the helm of it, we've heard a lot about how the coalition that elected Biden into the Oval Office in 2020 is starting to break down, be it younger voters, be it voters of color, black or Lat Latino kind of Americans. He obviously is trying to address one particular of those groups in Philadelphia today. But how much do, do these questions around things like democracy and the Supreme Court and, and, and faith in these institutions? institutions actually service the Biden campaign? Or when you are kind of seen as the poster child for the institution of government, does it only actually end up wor working to hurt you? You're the figurehead. Yeah, I think the issue of democracy being on the ballot has helped the Democrats since the Dobbs decision and January 6th, which are two things that have happened, obviously, since Donald Trump um, lost, the, the, lost the, the presidency. And he's got to, Joe Biden's got to keep talking about those. To the Supreme Court and democracy's point, if Donald Trump wins, he will likely be able to appoint two more Supreme Court justices. Keep reminding people that would be a 5-4 majority of Donald Trump appointees on the court, and your grandchildren will likely be alive before these people are off. They have no elections. They serve for life. Joe Biden's got to keep saying this, and I'm saying this as a, you know from a strategy perspective. Um, so that's what they've got to be talking about, not sending an 80-year-old actor down to Wall Street to fight with Donald Trump supporters. I mean, you know, to me, it's mind boggling what they did yesterday. He's right to be in Philly today. He should be talking about Alito not recusing himself. And these are the kinds of issues that people care about and will come out to Lisa's point and vote on. All right. Our great panel with us today. Thank you so much, Jeannie Shanzano and Lisa Camuso Miller. Thanks to our panel. We'll have more from our panelists tomorrow. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.